Okay, welcome everyone. Tonight we are going to do uh, two chapters, chapter 34 and chapter 35. For those of you who have 70 faces. So the first one is what's called notarikon. It is, uh, it's a Greek word. And it's a type of acronym. We, we learned last week about acronyms. An acronym is, let's say you have four or five words and you take the first letter of each of those words and that itself forms another word. Notarikon is a little bit different where you take one word and each letter of the word becomes an acronym. So it's all like in one word. So it is an ac a type of acronym, but it's, again, it's not spread out over two, three, four, five different words, but it's all from the same, the same word. So this, this is a, a, a method that, like almost everything we've been learning is not a new kind of method. It goes all the way back, all the way back. So we're going to explore some of them. Some, maybe some of you know already, others will be new. So the first one is on the, uh, the name Adam, the first human. So this is from the Arizal. The Arizal, based on the idea that Adam is, is what's called a Neshama Klalit, an all-inclusive soul. In other words, all of humanity comes from Adam and Chava. So, in a sense, all of uh, all of the uh, progeny that came from them were, was included in them. So the Arizal took the name Adam, and uh, which is Aleph Dalad Mem. And he said the Aleph stands for Adam himself, or really Adam and Chava, because when Adam was created, he was created male and female. The Dalad is David, and the Mem is Mashiach. In other words, he took this name Adam, and based on the idea that all souls would come from him, and he made like a, a historical uh, notarikon. Adam, David, Mashiach. You know, it's all of history. All of history is found in, in this name. So this is a, this is a fairly well-known one. But we can, also, we can also do the same thing very closely that the Aleph, is Avraham, because Avraham and Sarah were also considered all-inclusive souls, because all the Jewish people would come from them. And we're told also that for almost their whole marriage, they were having marital relations, but it was not leading to children. So it's given over in Kabbalah that the, the result of their marital union, all the times it did not produce physical children, produced the souls of future converts. So this is a very, very beautiful thing because when someone converts, so their, the, the name of their father and mother become Avram and Sarah. So that's a very nice uh, custom, but here we're saying it's, it's actually a little bit deeper than that. In a certain sense that the soul of the convert is produced by Avram and Sarah in a spiritual sense. So that's a very, very beautiful understanding of uh, a convert being called uh, Ben or Bat, Avram and Sarah, the son or daughter of Avram and Sarah. So the Aleph of Adam could also be understood to be Avraham. We're also told that Avraham and Sarah are, are the first incarnations 
of Adam and Chava, and that they begin the work of fixing what happened in the Garden of Eden. So the Aleph is Avram, the Dalad is David, and the Mem is Moshe. Now the first two letters of Moshe are the same as the first two letters of Mashiach. So again, the Ari said Adam, David, Mashiach, but also we can understand Avram, David, Moshe. Now, especially because about Moshe, it says, Hu HaGoel HaRishon, Hu HaGoel HaAcharon. He is the first redeemer, and he is the last redeemer. So the mem of, of both of these versions are Moshe and Mashiach, who soul-wise are actually the same soul. So this is a very, very um, well-known notarikon from the Arizo. Now, Rav Ginsburg, uh, this is really one of my favorite teachings. It's a very simple teaching, but he does a similar thing, but not with names. He takes the three letters of Adam and says that this represents three different qualities or dynamics of a human being. And just like the Arizal, in, in a sense, in, in, encapsulated all of history in this name Adam, so Rav Ginsburg encapsulates the essence of, a, of an Adam, of a human being. The Aleph is Emuna, faith. The word in Hebrew for faith is Emuna. The Dalad is Da'at, knowledge. And the mem is maase, action. So what's the, 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 the teaching here? Is that the, like the goal, this, or the spiritual direction of a human being is to reach a level of faith, faith in God, faith in the world, faith in themselves, faith in positivity, but that faith is not blind faith. That faith has to be based on the Dalad of Adam, which is dot, knowledge. In other words, it's not just this, this vague, blind kind of faith. It's a faith based on everything I know to be true. And we see this in the Shema. The Shema is called the carnal statement of faith of the Torah, of the Jewish people. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, a statement of faith in, in one God. And we know that in the Shema, there's two large letters, the ayin of the first word Shema and the Dalad of the last word Echad, one. So when you read them in their order, it's aid, which means witness. Ayin Dalad means witness. So this is hinting to us that this is the task of the Jewish people to be witnesses to the world of one God. But if you take those two same large letters, and, and by the way, this is the only verse in the entire Tanakh that has two large letters in one verse. So if you take the ayin and dalad and you reverse them, it's dalad ayin is no, to know. So here we have the unity of knowing and faith. So that's the aleph of Adam is emuna, faith. The dalad is da'at, knowing. And the mem is ma'aseh, action. So in other words, this is the crucial third step that a person needs to, <coughs> excuse me, to take their faith, ground it in knowledge, and then put it into action, put it into the world, make it happen, spread those ideas, or base our lives on those ideas. So this is a very, very simple and basic 
teaching using this method, uh, notari con. But the, the, the teaching is so fundamental. Faith, knowledge, and action. Emuna, dat, and maase. Okay. Next, we're going to learn uh, a slightly different version of notarikon. Usually, notarikon is you have a word and you take each of the letters, as we've done twice already, and each of the letters begins another word or concept. Here, and um, in the next one as well, it's, it's a similar thing, but here we're taking the numerical value of each of the letters in the word to, to, to reveal a concept. The first one is, uh, actually both of these are from Ralph Ginsburg. And uh, it's really an amazing one because uh, in, the, in the Torah for the last four or five weeks on and off, we've been learning about the clothing of the Kohanim in the, in the temple, in the Mishkan. And what we learn is that the regular Kohanim, the regular priests, wore four garments on a daily, daily level. The high priest had eight. He had four extra vestments, which made him look like the Kohen Gadol. Um, he, the special breastplate and a, a special a, a crown that he wore. So the Kohen Gadol had eight clothings and the regular Kohenim had four. And in last week's Parsha, that's what we were learning about, is the seven-day preparation of the Kohanim when they're getting ready to dedicate the tabernacle in the desert. That's what we learned about in the Parsha. The second half of last week's Parsha was about the Kohanim and, and their preparation. And so we're told that for those seven days, there was a seven day preparation on the eighth day, that's this week's Parsha. This week's Parsha is called Shmini, which means the eighth day. The eighth day is when the tabernacle was put up and left up and it was inaugurated and uh, sanctified and the service began. That happens in this week's Parsha. So for the seven days of preparation, we're told that uh, Aaron was not the high priest. Moshe acted as the high priest on God's command. And he wore just one white garment. He did not wear the garments of the high priest because he was not meant to be the high priest. And he didn't even wear the four because he's not a coin. He was a levy. But at God's instruction, because he was in charge of putting up the Mishkan until it was ready for the service, and then Aaron took over as high priest, he wore one white garment. So Rav Ginsburg says an amazing thing is if you take the word echad, one, so we see the, the first letter Aleph equals one, this is the one garment that Moshe wore in the, uh, the seven-day preparation for putting up the Mishkan. The next letter of Echad is Chet. These are the eight, Chet equals eight. These are the eight garments of the high priest that Aaron would wear. And then the Dalet of Echad is the four garments of a regular priest. So Rav Ginsburg was saying this idea of echad can be seen in the three different types of clothing of the priest. Now, why this is significant is because when they put the Mishkan together, so first of all, going way back to Parsha Truma, 
a list of ingredients or, or uh, materials that were needed for the Mishkan were listed. And there were exactly 13. 13 equals echad. So in other words, the idea, it wasn't just uh, a coincidence that there were 13 materials. The idea was to put together the Mishkan in a way that it would symbolize and actually become a vessel for God's oneness to, to fill the Mishkan. But that's also true with the, with the clothing. And in general, the idea of clothing, even our own clothing, is the idea that our vessels, our clothing, should be uh, fitting for the oneness of God to manifest with, within us. So that's a, a different type of notarikon according to numbers. So now we're going to do the same thing in a, in a different way. And that uh, relates to Yitzchak. So Rav Ginsburg explains that the name Yitzchak First, let me say, Yitzchak of the three patriarchs was the only one that didn't leave Israel. And in fact, at God's command, because at one point there was a famine. And when there was a famine by, uh, in the life of uh, Avram and Sarah, they left and they went to Egypt for a short time. And later, Yaakov when he, when he went to get married, he left Israel. And then when he went down to Egypt. So when there was a famine in Yitzhak's time, God came to him and said, don't leave the land. So there was obviously some very, very deep connection between Yitzhak and the land of Israel. That God said, your, your soul can't is not fitting to leave Eretz Yisrael. Your soul is so connected, you need to stay in the land. So Rav Ginsburg brings down a beautiful Torah. If you take the name Yitzchak, <coughs> four letters, a Yud, a Tzadi, a Chet, and a, a Kuf. So he explains like this. He said, there's actually four main ways that we, that we, we call Eretz Yisrael. So the first one is Eretz Yisrael. We live in Medina Yisrael. For all of history, this was called Eretz Yisrael. I mean, it was called Eretz Canaan. But once we settled it, it became Eretz Yisrael. So the first letter of Yitzhak's name is a Yud, like Yisrael. The tzadi is the first letter of the word svi. I believe we learned this a few weeks ago in, in a different method. Why And Israel is sometimes called Eretz Svi, the land of the deer. Why is that? So we're given two reasons. First of all, actually three reasons. The first reason is, is because a deer it's, uh, it's hide, it's, it's, it's so taut that if you would skin a deer, you would never be able to put the, the hide back onto the deer because it's so taut. And this represents, it's like the yud, the little that holds a lot. It holds so much that you can, you can barely uh, put borders around it. So that's one reason it's called Eretz Svi. The other one is Svi in Gematria equals Emuna, equals faith. And Eretz Israel, it's, it's the faith that we had for 2,000 years that we would come back to this land, which in, in historical precedent was bordering on the impossible. Nothing had ever happened like that, that a people were separated from their homeland for 2,000 years 
and they never gave up the faith that they would come back. And we did. So it's called Eretz V, which really means Eretz Emuna. And in our alternative alphabets in Atbash, Moshe, the three letters of Moshe, equals Tzvi. And we know that Moshe, more than anything, wanted to come into Eretz Yisrael. And the name he's given in the Zohar is Raya Mehemna, the, the shepherd of faith. So for all of these reasons, Eretz Yisrael is called Eretz Svi. So that's the second letter of Yitzhak's name. The Chet is the first letter of Chaim. And many times Eretz Yisrael is called Eretz Chaim, the land of life. And the last one, the last letter of Yitzhak's name is the Kuf. And that is maybe, along with Eretz Yisrael, we, we, we refer to Israel as the Holy Land. In Hebrew, Eretz HaKodesh, beginning with a Kuf. So here we see just a very, very te beautiful teaching based on the idea that Yitzhak was, it seemed he was about to leave the land because of the famine. And God said, no, you can't leave the land. Your, your, your soul is too um, enmeshed with the land. So we see four names of, of, that we refer to Israel are the four letters of Yitzhak's name. Yisrael, Tzvi, Chaim, and Kodesh. So that's a, just a very, 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 <coughs> excuse me, beautiful teaching. While we're at it, so a different Torah is that the same four letters of Yitzhak, when translated into numbers, also represent Yitzhak's life. The Yud of Yitzhak equals 10, and this represents the 10 trials of his father Avraham. And of course, the 10th is when Avraham took Yitzchak, what's called Akeda Yitzchak, the binding of Yitzchak. The 10th and the culminating test was with Yitzchak. So, and this was stamped deeply into his neshama. So the Yud is the 10th test. The Tzadi is his son equals 90. His mother was 90 years old when she gave birth to him. The Chet equals eight. This, he is the first person to be circumcised on the eighth day. Avram got the command to circumcise, but he circumcised himself at age 99. Yitzchak was the first Jew who was uh, circumcised at eight days. And then the last letter, Kuf, a hundred was how old Avram was when he gave birth to Yitzhak. So again, this is just a very, very beautiful way through numbers and through letters to take the name Yitzhak and then expand it to really understand who Yitzhak was. Now, the next one is on page 324. And this is a really, really important one. And this is actually mentioned in the Talmud. This is another showing that this, this method is from, uh, it goes back quite literally 2,000 years ago. And this is on the first word of the Ten Commandments. The first word of the Ten Commandments, Anochi, I, which is like Ani, but has a Chaf in it. Ani, Anochi, I am God, your God, who has taken you out of the land of Egypt and the house of bondage. So it says in the Talmud, the four letters of Anochi, the Aleph is Ana, the Nun is Nafshi, the Chaf is Katvit, and the Yod is Yahavit which means it's very, very hard to 
translate this exactly, but it means I have written myself down and given myself to you. Ananafshe, my soul, as it were, my being, uh, I have written down. Katvit, and then Yahavit, and given to you. So this is like just an amazing statement of, of what the Torah, that's what we always say that the Torah is the expressed will of God. But this goes like almost one step deeper that, that God is saying, I took my essence and I in, in, engraved into, I, I engraved my essence into the letters of the Torah and I've given it to you. I'm giving you my essence. I'm giving you everything, my, my, my whole will. So this is in the Talmud, but this is uh, an incredibly important uh, idea. That's what the Zohar uh, said that God and the Torah are one. And in other words, the Torah is connected to God, and we are connected to the Torah. And another place is uh, Yisrael Doraita Bekuch Abrihu Chadhu. Israel, the Torah, and the Holy One, blessed be He, are one. So here God is saying, I'm one with the Torah. That's why we, we give so much reverence to a Sefer Torah because it's not just a scroll or a book. It's, we believe that the holiness is, is in a sense, it's, it, it contains God's will, God's essence. And that's given over in a uh, notirakon. That's what we've been learning. <clears throat> okay, the next one we're gonna do on 326, there, there are really many different ones that have to do with the name Yisrael. One of them is, and I believe we've mentioned this already, but here we'll take the five letters of Yisrael and we, we see that the first letter of the names of all of the patriarchs and matriarchs are in the name Yisrael. The Yud is Yitzchak and Yaakov. The Shin or Sin of Yisrael is Sarah. The Resh is Rachel and Rivka. The Aleph is Avraham. And the Lamed is Leah. So this is just a very, very beautiful idea, a beautiful idea to teach children. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Okay, my wife wanted me to show you this. This is from um, Avraham Lowenthal, a, a good friend of ours, an artist in, in Sfat. So you'll see up here, instead of just spelling out Yisrael with the five letters, he, he showed it. This is um, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Sarah, Rachel, Rivka, Avraham, Leah. So he, he did it like in the expanded form to, to show the whole thing. Now, another one you'll see on page 327, this is also a, a, a very well-known one is that the, the five letters of Yisrael stand for Yesh, Shishim, Rivo, Otiyot, LaTorah. Yesh, there are Shishim, Rivo, which means literally 60, 10 thousands, which means 600,000. Otiyot, letters, LaTorah, to the Torah. So this is a very, very, um, uh, well-known and important idea that there are 600,000 uh, what are called uh, 
primary souls or root souls in Israel that reappear in every generation, 600,000. And they correspond to the 600,000 letters in the Torah. And the teaching is means that every person has their letter in the Torah. So this whole series is 70 faces. But if you remember in the beginning, we learned that the Arizal said there's, there's not just 70 faces to the Torah. There's 600,000 faces to the Torah. In other words, each person, each root soul, has their special uh, perspective, special gateway, special connection with the, with the letters in the Torah. So here we see engraved in the name Yisrael, again, a notirakon. Now the last one we're gonna do um, is just a beautiful one on page 331. And this is, this is a, a teaching from Rabbi Zusha. Rabbi Zusha was a very, very famous Hasidic master, the brother of Rabbi Eli Melech in the, the, I guess you would call it the second slash third generation of the Hasidic movement. And he took the word tshuva, repentance or coming close to Hashem. And tshuva has five letters, taf, shin, vav, bet, he, five letters, and said that each one of these letters is the first letter of a verse. But he, I mean, there are many verses that begin with a taf or begin with a, a, a shin. But he picked verses that he felt these five verses, which correspond to the five letters of tshuva, they represent what tshuva is. So it's on page 331, those who have 70 faces. Just due to time, I'm just going to read them. And we're, we won't discuss them at great, at great length. But these, uh, these five verses really, really tell us all about tshuva. So the first one is the tav. And that is tamim tiya im Hashem elokecha. Which means walk simply with God, your God. This idea of, of simple faith, not simple meaning not sophisticated. It just means pure, um, dedicated, uh, um, just being real, <laughs> just being real. Tamim tiya im Hashem elokecha, sincere, true sincerity. Walk simply with God, your God. The second one is the shin of tshuva. And this we've, uh, for those who come on Tuesdays, we've discussed this many times, is shaviti Hashem lenegdi tamim. I place God before me at all times. There's a whole idea here is to do tshuva, is to come close to God. How do we come close to God? So the first one is, as it were, we walk with God. We're, 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 God is in our lives. He's walking next to us. We're walking in front of him. That's what it says about Avram. God says to Avram, walk before me and be sincere. The idea of, of, of leadership. Here, it's placing God before me at all times. If I want to be close to God, I, I, I have to have him in my consciousness. The vav is vahafta lorecha kamocha, to love your neighbor as yourself. This obviously is a very important part of, of coming close to Hashem, is to be close to other people. I remember Reb Shlomo used to say, if someone says, I'm getting so close to Hashem, I just don't like people so much. I'm not really interested in people. 
he said, no, that person is very far away from Hashem. You can't be close to Hashem and, and far away from everyone around you. So that's the Vav of Tshuva. The Bet, also one that we've talked about, is Bechal Derachecha De'ehu. Know him in all of your ways. Again, tshuva means coming close to Hashem. So we come close to Hashem when we recognize that everything we do in life is an opportunity to get close to Hashem, to be close to holiness, to raise our souls, to raise the world. That is what tshuva is. And the last one is hatsnei lechet im elokecha, which means walk modestly with your God. The importance of humbleness, the importance of getting beyond ego and um, what's called uh, nullifying one's will before God's will. To walk humbly with God, but also with other people. To, uh, and, and one can be incredibly successful and still maintain a deep humbleness. So that is, this is a classic notarikon, where we took the five letters of tshuva and saw that they represent five different verses explaining what tshuva is. Okay, now we're going to move into acrostics. And we have a limited amount of time, but acrostics is a slightly different than almost everything that we've learned up to now. But it's very, very important because it's used so much and it's based on one idea. An acrostic really means taking the 22 Hebrew letters and ordering uh, either a song or a poem or a passage according to the Aleph Beit. And as we'll see uh, shortly, also with people's names. And the idea very simply is that since the world is created through the Aleph Bet and the Torah is basically letters, it's words and verses and passages and parshas, but when it gets down to it, it's letters. And the, the most all-encompassing idea is this idea from Aleph to Tav, from the first letter to the last letter. And I think it was either last week or in the Tuesday class, we talked about right in the first verse of the Torah, it says, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve et ha'oretz. Now the word et, it, it, there is no real translation for it. It's an, it, it, it grammatically it introduces a noun. But since it's Aleph Tav, it means everything included. So we read the first verse of the Torah in the beginning, God created the heavens. The heavens mean, means everything spiritual that would ever be created from Aleph to Tav. Et HaShemayim. The Et HaOretz. And everything physical or material that would ever be created. So this idea of using the letters as an all-encompassing framework to give over ideas. So we're going to learn uh, uh, as many as we can quickly. And we see it in probably the most ancient example is in the book of Psalms. In the book of Psalms, there are at least three Psalms that are ordered according to the Aleph Bet. The first verse is an Aleph, and then the second begins with a Bet and Gimel. And that is uh, Psalm 34. 
Ashrei, we say it three times a day, even though we add in the beginning a, 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 a two verses to introduce it, but it begins, the actual uh, Tehillim begins with the Aleph, and, and we say it three times a day. It's considered one of the most important of all the Psalms, and it's ordered according to the Aleph Bet. So that's the 145th Psalm. So the 34th Psalm, we say it every Shabbos morning, the 145th, and the longest Psalm is the 119th Psalm. And this is very, very interesting because it's all 22 letters, but each letter, there are eight verses for each letter. In other words, Aleph, there'll be eight verses that begin with Aleph. Eight verses that begin with Bet. And therefore, just simple mathematics, 22 times eight equals 176. And it is by far the longest of the, of the Psalms. And what's interesting, though, is the theme of the 119th Psalm from, from King David is all about the Torah. Is, is like 176 different verses connecting David to his love of Torah and his, his love of God. So this is a classic example of a, an acrostic going back 3,000 years. Now, another ancient one is, we'll see on page 334. And this is the book of Lamentations. The Lamentations goes back 20, uh, 2,500 years. It was written by Jeremiah. And today, we there, there are five chapters to the book of Lamentations. We read a Tish above night. And he, the, the, originally there was chapters one, two, and four. Later, chapters three and five, he added. Now, the amazing thing is, when you read the book of Lamentations, it's about the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem and, and, and the people. The amazing thing is, he wrote this before any of it happened. Before any of it happened, it was pure prophecy. But like any prophecy, he took it to the, the king and he said, if you, if, if you and the kingdom if, and the people don't change their ways, then Jerusalem will be destroyed. And like any prophecy, it didn't have to happen. But Jeremiah saw clearly God granted him a, a prophecy of what would happen if the people didn't change their ways. But the idea is that these chapters are written in acrostics. And so the Gomorrah actually asks, why did Jeremiah order the book of Lamentations according to acrostics? And so they answer very simply. They said, because the people did not keep the Torah which is made from the letters from Aleph to Tuf. Therefore, when the, 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 the temple was destroyed and the people were sent into exile, so Jeremiah ordered it according to the letters of the, of the alphabet. Now, another one that also, I, 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 I'm beginning with ones from a long time ago. So King David is 3,000 years ago. Jeremiah is 2,500 years ago. And the other one is uh, from King Solomon, who 
wrote the book of Proverbs. The last chapter of the book of Proverbs, the 31st chapter, is what's called Eshet Chayil, a woman of valor. And it is sung by husbands to their wives every um, Friday. Even, even if, if it's just young people and no one's married, we, we still sing it. But it's, it's written um, towards a woman of valor. There are different versions of who wrote it and for whom. We won't get into that right now. But here also it's written as an acrostic. And it goes through all, all the different ways that we, we praise and laud a woman of valor. But again, it's just the idea from Aleph through Tav. That, a, that, that this woman of valor is able, I'll, I'll use a modern term, multitask. <laughs> She's able to like do it all from Aleph to Tuff. She can do the whole, the whole thing. So that's just another very ancient um, example um, of, of that. Now on, on Tisha B'Av, so we, we, we read or chant uh, different, they're called piyutim, uh, poetry that is very mournful. And these particular piyutim are called keynote. And the first kina was written by Jeremiah. And there's, there's now many, many, many different keynote. Um, the, the most famous of them is called the Kalir. There's much discussion about who he was and when he lived. Most people associate that he lived in the 6th or 7th century um, uh, of the Common Era. And he wrote almost all of the keynote in acrostics because it's all based on the book of Lamentations. And so he took the lead and he wrote almost all of his keynote according to, to different acrostics. And some of them are very complicated, not just Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalad, each verse begins with that. But sometimes they're very, very complicated how he does it. But again, this is just an example of how far back this uh, idea goes. Another example of an acrostic is the Rambam. So his Maimonides, his classic legal book called the Mishnah Torah, he begins with an acrostic, which, which is Yud and He and Vav and He. Yesod Ha Yesodot Ve Yesode Ha Chachma. The, 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 the foundation of all wisdom. And he wrote it out in an acrostic of a yud and a he and a vav and a he. Now the same thing, we'll see that in, in almost every shul, universally on Kabbalat Shabbat, so we, we sing a, a this beautiful poem called Yadid Nefesh, the beloved of our soul. Uh, Many, many different tunes for it, but in most synagogues around the world, they, they begin Kabbalat Shabbat with Yedi Nefesh, and there are four stanzas, and the first letter of each stanza spells out Yud, and then a He, and a Vav, and a He. So that's, here's two other examples of taking this idea of a cross. Now here, it's not the Aleph Bet, but here in both of these cases, it's taking the name Yudke Vavke and, uh, and wedging it into 
what they're trying to give over. Now we're going to, we, we mentioned Kabbalat Shabbat, and now we're, we're gonna end with, it be, started to become tradition. And I mentioned that the, the author of most of the keynote of the very sad poems that we, that we recite on Tisha B'Av, uh, he was called the Kalir. And there's a very, very, uh, until recently, uh, a somewhat uh, mysterious Jewish poet called Yanai. And there was not much known about him. There was different traditions that, that there was this famous uh, Jewish poet. And, uh, but apparently in the, in the uh, Cairo Geniza, the Cairo Geniza is very, very famous that they found in the synagogue in Cairo, um, a, an enormous, enormous ca cachet of ancient um, parchments. And to this day, they're still going through them. Th these were found uh, a couple of decades ago. And I remember we were in, um, uh, we were on a Jewish tour of of England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. And we were in England and we went to um, Oxford, Oxford University. And we, we, we had like this, uh, not a class, but a, a get together with a number of Israeli uh, researchers. This was just a few years ago that they had found in the, the, the Cairo Geniza writings from Maimonides. And, you know, they were pouring over them like every, every letter to, you know, determine all kinds of things. A lot of it, they only had scraps and, you know, they had to put them together. Um, anyways, in the Cairo Geniza, they found many, 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 many um, poems from this Yanai, who had been this mysterious figure. And now historically, they, uh, they feel that he was the teacher of the Kalir. And apparently he was the first one who embedded his name in his poetry. And now I'm gonna bring you a whole bunch of examples of very, very um, uh, well-known, um, what are called Zmirot or, or different songs that if you look carefully at the first letter of the stanzas, they spell out the name of the authors. This became a, a very big thing. And again, it started apparently from this Yanai in around the 500s or 600s, something like that. Now it's significant because um, one of my grandsons is named, his second name is after this poet is Olam Yanai. So I have a soft place in my heart for this, this poet. <laughs> Anyways, probably the most uh, famous uh, poem or, or song is L'cha Dodi. That, that universally is saying every Kabbalah Shabbat all over the world and Again, when you look at the first words of the stanza, it spells out Shlomo HaLevi. Shlomo the Levi, because it was written by Rabbi Shlomo Alkabetz. And um, he embedded his name in the Chadodi. Now, many people wouldn't even notice it. Sometimes you don't, unless it's pointed out, many people uh, in, in some of the Zmirot that will point out, don't, don't even pick up on it unless, unless the book is written in a way where it bolds it. 
where you can actually actually see. So what's interesting is Shlomo Alkabetz, he was the brother-in-law of Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, the Ramak. The Ramak was the, the premier teacher of Kabbalah in Sfat before the Ari came, before the Arizal came, Rabbi Yitzhak Luria. And his brother-in-law was Shlomo Alkabetz, who introduced him to Kabbalah. In other words, in his uh, younger ages, he, he concentrated on Jewish law. But it was his brother-in-law who introduced him to Kabbalah. When the Ramak passed away at age 48, the Arizal then became the premier teacher in, in Sfat. So what's interesting is that um, all three of them are buried together. The, 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 Rabbi Shlomo Alkabetz is buried right next to the Ari, and right below the Ari is the Ramak. Now I'm mentioning this is because Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, he, he, he left no writings. Now, all, everything we know from Rabbi Yitzhak Luria comes from his uh, top student, Rabbi Chaim Vital. But he wrote three poems for Shabbos. Three poems. We sing one at night, one in the day, and one at third meal. And all three of them, he embedded his name in the first letters of the, uh, of the stanzas. At night, it spells out Ani, Yitzchak, Luria. And this is, is um, a little mysterious. Ben Sheish. I, Yitzchak Luria, the son of Sheish, or six years old. <laughs> now, we know that he wasn't six years old when he wrote it, and I'm sure there's an explanation, maybe even someone knows and can put it in the chat, but he spells out his name in the day poem that he wrote. Again, he, he, he he spells out Ani Yitzchak Lur. He doesn't, he stops. He doesn't put the last two letters of his name. And then for third meal, also he, he, spells, he spells out his, his name. And these three poems are, 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 are these, this is what we have from the Arizal in his own, in his own writing. So, he put his name in all of them. Now, we don't have time now, but if one would look in a, what's called a, 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 a book of Zmirot that we sing, most of the songs for Friday night, Shabbos day, and third meal, all, not all of them, but most of them have the name of the person in the first um, stanzas of, of, their, uh, of their songs. So this idea of acrostics uh, is, it's, it's not your typical method of darshaning out the Torah, but still, it's, it's, it's a method that we see stretching back. The, the first example I brought was from King David 3,000 years ago until fairly recently, this idea of organizing, whether it's poetry or songs or passages or keynote or psalms according to the acrostics of the Hebrew letters. So we should all be um, inspired by the letters of the Torah 
that that we want to like kind of stamp these letters in our reality in our consciousness uh, these letters like shaviti hashem lenegdi to me i put the name of god before me at all times so here different authors wanted to put the letters of the torah before them at all times 